This was something very symbolic. I knew that whatever was down there was part of some ancient passing into the afterlife ceremony. You know, they've gone through many uses over time, but never as a tomb. You know, it's sort of like we've lost so much of our history. The earth is like hundreds of millions of years old. I recently booked an appointment with Jamie of Refractive Healing. As she was working on me, I felt such a comfort, such a gentle embracing energy flow through my body. A sore throat that I had been dealing with was made significantly better. I want to share this gift with you. Book your free distant healing session with Jamie right here or using the link in my description. Thank you to Refractive Healing for partnering with me in this video. I am here with Kathy Forty. She has had a near-death experience, which we're going to learn about today. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, well, thank you, Melissa. Yes, it was, my, my life started out very strange. I've had some strange experiences. So this was not that unusual that later on in life, I actually had a near-death experience as well. Wow. Okay. Well, maybe we should start out with the beginning of your life and the strange experiences that you had. Would you be okay with that? Sure. Sure. I mean, the first time was when I was 18 years old and I lived in Chicago at the time. And I was involved in the theater world, not in the journalism or the, as later on, I went to become, I became a clinical psychologist. But I was coming back from working in a theater production and I was assaulted. And I thought for sure I was going to die in this, this attack. And it was amazing. Just as I was getting really, I was going, I was, all this energy was coming up and, and that I felt like I was going to start screaming because I realized this was it for me. A screen opened in my mind, like a movie screen. And I saw myself in the future as an older woman. And I was sitting in this living room with, uh, I remember so clearly, it was a black lacquer Chinese rocking chair. And I could see the antiques on a hutch on the corner and the, the colors of the sofa, everything. And two children were sitting at my feet, but they were faceless children. And I was reading a children's book to them. I wouldn't, I wouldn't realize that later on in life, I would write some children's books. And and in that moment, I knew I was going to survive that attack and live to be an older woman. And so this total calm and peace came over me. And I was able to survive the incident without him getting using the knife on me and shutting me up. So but years later, when I lived in New York City, I walked into the house for the first time of the person who I would marry. And there was the black lacquered Chinese rocking chair. There was the antiques and everything just as I had seen it in my, in my, in, in this vision. And although he has passed and he's no longer of this earth, I saw into a most likely probable future. And that's all that I needed. Some force behind me wanted to know, don't do anything crazy and you will survive this attack. And, and so it was a psychic opening for me. And then, you know, I, I had prophetic dreams and things like that over the years, but it wasn't until 2003 that I actually had a near-death experience. But the, the crazy thing was I'd work with children who had cancer as I was a journalist for CBS News many years ago, and we were working on New York, the Ronald McDonald House a home for children who, you know, were staying there for Memorial Sloan Kettering while they were being treated, the hospital. And I remember writing a book about near-death experiences for children and death and dying, which led, P I was talking to therapist groups and they kept saying, well, what's, what are your credentials? You know, and as sooner or later I went back and I got my clinical psychology degree. So everything was kind of leading up Till that day in 2003 when I had, I was my private practice in Los Angeles. So I moved from Chicago to New York to Los Angeles. And I was, I had an evening client. I was going kind of late, it was probably about eight o'clock or so that time. And she was a Buddhist nun. 
And she said, oh, tonight is the night of the Wiesak moon. And of course, I, I didn't really know what a Wiesak moon is. It happens in, in May, usually the first week in May or so forth like that. And I said, well, what is that? What's the difference? And she goes, it's when the veils between the dimensions are very thin and anything can happen. And, you know, I, I kind of filed that away, but didn't think anything much of it. So as I left for the day, I'm going, I'm walking to my car. And all of a sudden, I mean, I do look up at the moon and it kind of looks like any other moon to me. You know, it's not anything out of the ordinary. Uh, but after I looked at the moon, I felt this whoosh energy right out of my solar plexus area. Very strange sensation. And with it, I was left immediate with a profound sense of emptiness, as if I had lost all my best friends. Nobody was there anymore with me. And I felt like I was done with my work on earth as I knew it. And that was a very strange sensation. I'd never had that before. And I wasn't incapacitated, but it was like, am I getting ready to die? And if I am, and if I'm not, do I have to feel this sense of emptiness for the rest of my life? And I didn't, I knew that was not going to be a pleasant sensation. And I still didn't know what it meant. So I went home, went home and I'm sitting there drinking some tea on the, on the, on the couch, and I'm thinking about what this could mean because I'm still feeling like I'm empty inside. And all of a sudden, I saw a swirling vortex in my head. And the next minute, I was sucked into this tunnel. And I was horizontal, I was feet first, and I was traveling really fast, and I could see light at the end of the tunnel. And immediately, I thought, oh, is this the light everyone's been talking about? And the next thought was, if it is, did I just die? And if I died, what did I die of? I wasn't sick, you know? It's funny, you have all these thoughts race, at least for me, I had all these thoughts racing through my mind. And I, the, I thought to myself, well, if I die, there's not much I can do about it now. Let's just go see what it's all about. But before I could go into the light, I was stopped. And I just hovered there. And I tried to will myself to go into that light. And my, my near death was a lot different than other people's. And I, I tried to will myself to go into the light. I couldn't move into it. And I remember thinking, well, this is boring. And with that thought, this is boring. All this energy poured into me, spun me back around and sent me back through the tunnel as fast as could be. And I was back in my physical body and my whole left side was paralyzed. And I heard voices in my head saying, breathe, Kathy, breathe. And I knew in that moment that somehow, for some reason, my heart had stopped and these voices were trying to get me to breathe back into my, breathe life back into my physical form. And, you know, I never heard voices like this before and they were very distinct and I was alone and the tea had spilled all over me. And I'm thinking, well, I, I, you know, it's, I have, I have no choice. Just listen to what they said. And they just kept saying, relax, everything will be okay. Relax, everything will be okay. And I could actually hear in my head clicking as they were putting my left side of my body, reconnecting it. And so that I had feeling again, I said my left side was paralyzed. I wouldn't know till years later when I actually went to a cardiologist, he said, I don't understand why there's scarring, scar tissue on the left side of your heart. Have you ever had a heart attack? And, you know, I didn't want to get into the whole subject of the near-death experience with this doctor. And so I just kind of noted that, but it wasn't until years later. But anyway, as, as I'm feeling back in my body, I'm feeling just a little pressure in my chest. And I'm thinking to myself, I am going to have to see a cardiologist. And the voices in my head said, no, nope, everything is okay. You'll be fine. Well, the next day I went to see clients and there was something different going on. I could, I could feel everything they were feeling and I could feel their anger. I could feel their emotions. And that's not a pleasant thing to, to, cause I, you can separate what's mine and what's theirs. And this was going on the whole day. And at night I would wake up between three and 4 AM every night with all of these thoughts about the universe, about energy, about quantum physics, about whatever going through my mind. And I couldn't go back to sleep unless I actually physically got up, went to my computer and, and researched what was going on and what, what I was hearing in my head. And the interesting thing was that I was understanding some of these concepts, even though I had no background in it. 
And also that these voices in my head were correcting what I was reading. It was like they were saying, well, this is true. This is not true, but this is as far as your race's understanding of this, this, this area is so far. And this was going on night after night. And the next morning, you know, I'd be feeling all my client stuff. So I, you know, I thought, I don't know what happened to me during this, this uh, particular near-death experience. So I called a friend of mine. He's a very gifted uh, medical intuitive, and he had worked with me on very difficult clinical cases in the past where with the client's permission and just giving their name to him and not anything about their history or psychological background, he would look behind the scenes from a soul perspective and see what was going on with them. So I simply said, can you, can you look and see anything that's going on with me right now? I didn't tell him about the experience. And he took a long time and he said, well, Kathy, you almost died. He said, but the interesting thing is, he said, all your old guidance left and you have a whole new set of guidance now. That was that whoosh feeling that, that, that from my solar plexus, which I hadn't heard anybody talk about the feeling of when your guides leave you. And he says, you have a whole new set of guides. And he says, they're very technologically oriented. He said, and he used the words almost kind of geeky. And I, I, my first thought was, well, what do they want? And he said, he said, this looks like a soul contract. He said, he said, it's showing me that you were sent back. He said, he said, you could have kept going, but I guess on some level, you must have decided you were going to go back. He said, they're showing me that you're going to develop or invent some type of, I don't know. He says, it looks like some type of medical thing. And I, and I thought to myself, oh no, that can't be, <laughs> you know, I don't know anything about electronics. I don't know anything about inventing or, or anything like that. And he said, nope. He said, that's, that's what I'm seeing. He said, he said, it, it will be a different type of conceptual thing. Uh, and I thought, oh, he's finally wrong. I mean, I'd worked with him for years and he had been so accurate. And I thought this just does not make sense. But, you know, it was it pursued me like this magnificent obsession. If I tried to walk away from whatever this thing was that I was supposed to do, it, it was like all the obstacles would come in my path to put me back going towards what it was until finally one day. I thought, okay, well, maybe I'll, I just need to contact another inventor or something like that and see what we can come up with. And when I do that, it got even worse. And so I finally said, I don't understand. What, what do you want? And they said, we want you to do this, not someone else. You already understand these concepts from a past life. And it's just, you're just going to bring it forth again. So when I finally, you know, reluctantly agreed to do whatever it was, I didn't know what I was going to do. Then all these inf this information started coming through. It came through in downloads. For, sometimes I would hear voices in my head telling me. Sometimes they would look inside my memory banks to see what I already knew and show me pictures. And then other times whole concepts would come down. And the gist of it was, because I didn't know really know where all this was going, was that uh, everything in the universe was mathematically coded. Uh, they said, you know, frequency is frequency, he said, but there is a faster route into the cellular consciousness of the body. And that is through math. The, un the cells understand mathematical codes. Math is the language of the universe. And, you know, I thought to myself, oh, well, this is this has got to be a cosmic joke because it was my first subject in school, math, you know? And so it started this process where it took five years and I didn't, I, you know, I didn't even tell a lot of my friends what I was doing because I thought they'd go, oh, poor Kathy, she's lost her mind, you know? And what, so it took five years to channel down thousands of different concepts, whether they be emotional stuff, whether they be minerals, herbs, vitamins, substances, anything, you name it, to get the mathematical algorithm for it. So it's sort of like I always use the, the example, like instead of taking vitamin C, if you fed the mathematical equivalent to the body and in information codes, you would have the same benefit. So that started a whole thing in uh, my technology. And that led from developing the Trinfinity 8 technology to a more spiritually based technology, the Ascension 11, 
And it was all based on mathematical algorithms, on the science of fractals, and to amplify information on this, on Solveggio frequencies, and to deliver it all through the body hooked into a computer through pure quartz crystal rods. And I mean, it, it looked like something from another world. In fact, people would say to me, oh, I remember this. This was Atlantean technology. It just looks different this time around. So, so yeah, that's, that was, that was kind of the beginning of the journey. And, and, you know, when I was done, at least in the first iteration of it, I just thought, oh God, I hope you didn't send me on a fool's mission on this. You know, right around that time, my father died at, within a, a few months after my near death experience. And in fact, I told him about mine and he later came back and he said, well, you were right. And he said, he said, and I didn't know what he was talking about. He said, well, when you told me about yours, you know, I didn't really believe you. And I thought, oh, that's nice. She came back, (laughs) you know, he said, but when I passed over, I understood what the tunnel, the light and everything else. And my mother died about a year later. And uh, so they left me money that I was able to actually develop this. And, and now those technologies are all over the world. So out of that little near death experience, but the interesting thing was I, you know, they told me they actually picked me because I didn't have any preconceptions about math. And so I couldn't say, you know, well, that won't work. You know, if they picked a mathematician, it might have been a whole different story. But the interesting thing about the, the light that I couldn't go into the light, they told me later, was that you, you are not coming back to this dimension when you pass, when you actually die in physical form in this one. If you go back into the light, you will keep coming back to third dimensional earth. And it's sort of like a reincarnation trap. So I had asked them, well, what does one do when one leaves instead of, you know, look going towards the light and seeing, you know, mom and dad and Jesus and all these, these shiny things that draw you in. They said, go to the stillness, go, go to the void. You'll be in the void, the stillness, and your soul will direct you to what level or realm or dimension or so forth you most resonate with. So, so that's, I said, well, why didn't I get, why didn't I get all the flowery things and the Jesus and everything else? And they said, well, you've done this so many times. And he said, and some people need more convincing than others, you know? So yeah, I didn't, I didn't get that flowery, you know, stuff. And, but, you know, it propelled me in a whole different realm it brought me back to my roots in Egypt and it opened my creativity and other things. So it was, it, it totally changed me. And, and the fact that I said, well, why did they, they said you had to, these voices, they said they came from the eighth dimension. They called themselves the founders race. And they said uh, it was easier because in the tunnel, it's a transformation, an energy conversion tunnel going from certain densities to other densities. This is a, a, a heavier density where some of the other dimensional realms, like there's 12 that they told me and each of those dimensional realms is within the other realm. So it is like a fractal. And they said that, that uh, it was easier to bring in a new set of guidance in the tunnel versus in my physical body in this realm. So that was, that was uh, kind of, uh, I mean, that's kind of the story in a nutshell. So yeah, there's a lot that a lot, a lot of things came from that afterwards. Hmm. Kathy, thank you so much for sharing. I have so many questions. I don't even know where to start. Why do you think it is that your original guides left and you got a new set of guides? Do you think that was part of the whole plan? Or do you think that you switched timelines somehow? Oh, that's a good question. I don't think I switched timelines. I found out later this was kind of a, a pre-contract and that, that sometimes our guides are not always set in place. You know, we have muses that come in and help with us. Like if you're a writer, you may have, you may draw from other past writers or those who are inspired in that realm to help you. And because of the nature of what they wanted me to do, my guides that I came in that brought me to that part in my life, you know, were not maybe sufficient enough to work with me on that particular, I mean, you had to think guides, you'd think guides know how to do everything, but they have specialties. They do have specialties. At least that's what I've learned. 
And um, so I was bringing in a, a little higher dimensional frequency uh, guides for the technology part. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And so they told you that you had some experience with this in a past life and you had yes. that knowledge and that's why they wanted you to create the technology. And then when you received that information, I think you said that you were channeling it. Yes. Was it, did you feel like you were remembering it from a past life or more like you were getting it from your guides? Uh, this I was actually felt like I was getting from the guides because it was it was strings of mathematical equations, algorithms in for people who don't know what algorithm algorithm is just like you follow a recipe. You know, mm -hmm. you put this sugar and then you put this cream and so forth. All those three ingredients make the cake. And that's the algorithm. So all these parts of the algorithm together were what, and behind like, let's say, let's say one particular program, there might be a hundred different algorithms behind it to make what comes through. We had, I was led to, I'd never done you know, like a vendor booth or a conference or anything like that prior to this. And when I, when the first iteration of Trinfinity 8 was done, they led me to this conference in Colorado. It was the International Society for the Study of Subtle Energy Medicines. And I just put a couple laptops out there with, with the signal boxes and the crystals attached into it and just invited people to give me their feedback. And before I knew it, I had, I had a line at my booth. And I wasn't charging anything. And I, a lot of the other people couldn't understand why, why I was, had a booth that, and I wasn't charging anything. And people were lined up. And they, a lot of these people that went to it could see energy. I can feel it, but I can't necessarily see it like they could. And when people were on the device, they were telling me what they were seeing. And they were talking excitedly. And I said, well, what are you seeing? He said, well, this is interesting. We're seeing like sharding, like glass shards coming out of the body. And I looked over and the program that was playing at the time was release emotional blockages. And then another time they said, oh, now we're seeing rainbow plumping coming out of the body. And I'd look over and it was balanced energy centers. And, you know, I had this one guy get on. He was an ophthalmologist and he also was a, a psychic. And I didn't know all any of this till later. And he came off the device and he was crying. He's the one that said, I remember this from past life. I didn't think I'd see it in this lifetime yet, but it looks different. He said, all of my guides came forward and knew immediately what to do with this technology. And he says, I saw them fine tuning it like a dial so that my psychic ability was even sharper. And he said, then I saw all these beings come forward and who who were behind the technology, and the, those were the eighth dimensional beings. And he said, and then we saw this man come forward who who identified himself as your father. And he, this guy didn't know anything about my background. And he and he said, just tell her it was money well spent. And remember, I said after he died, I, the inheritance from that. And you know, I thought, wow, that was a real confirmation for me. So. It was in the infancy stages then, and it grew. And, the, you know, I've got, you know, so many practitioners in all different areas around the country. Some, you know, use it for to speed up uh, tissue repair, for pain relief, or so forth like that. And, and some use it standalone, and some use it as an add-on. And it was, you know, it was sort of like they said to me at this conference, that we saw that many of these technologies would start to come down. And that's why we formed this, this particular association, because we saw in the future that many new technologies of this nature would, would come. And we wanted to have a forum. And he said, yours was the first we saw come through. So I'm, I'm sure, and I know there's others out there. There's been an explosion because when we look at it now, in the last hundred years, so many people from prior civilizations, Atlantean, which was so much even more technologically advanced than we have now, were all being reborn. And so we had an explosion in technology like never before. So that's these, this is like everybody's coming back and kind of tapping into their old, you know, what they remember. They may not consciously know that they remember this or, or tapping into the collective consciousness to bring forth this as part of this new evolutionary time. So 
you know, we're all cogs on the wheel and we all, even you, you know, bringing forth this knowledge to other people so that they can think outside the box and know that they're more than their physical body. Yeah, exactly. So you mentioned Atlantis and you also mentioned that you have had roots in Egypt. Have you had a past life in either of those places? Oh my gosh, yes. I'd in fact, love the last, to hear. You... The last lifetime I remember in Atlantis, unfortunately, it was a, wa a wave of water. And I was standing on the shore and I knew that I was going to. And to this day, I still have some fears of big waves. You know, I live in Maui. I live the ocean all around me. But I try to avoid the ocean on days where it, there's big, huge, the, when there's, there's, it's whipped up. The, land, the uh, wind is whipped up and, and waves are high. And um, so I, you know, in, in Egypt, I have more remembrance of what went on. And so I was told by my guides, you need to go find your roots again. You need to return to Egypt. So the first time I was in Egypt was I tried to go in 2000, um, what was it, 2000, uh, 2011. And a month before I was supposed to go there, Egypt uh, erupted. They had the Arab Spring uprising and Egypt shut down and, you know, tourist and, tourist, uh, tourism shut down and everything. So I had to wait two years to return there. So I went there with um, a small little group of three other people who I did not know who had been there before. And uh, I wasn't leading the group this time. Afterwards, I would start to lead groups there on my own. But I remember the first time in the king's chamber, um, I was, uh, I, I laid down in the sarcophagus. It's not really a sarcophagus, but I mean, it's, it's a container box. And it's such a wonderful sound resonance chamber that I just immediately started toning and chanting and feeling that vibration through me. And in the next moment, I saw um, in my mind's eye, the a lid close on the sarcophagus and shut me in. Now, there really is not a lid there in real life, but I saw it. It uh, shut closed and there was a brief moment of panic like I'm entombed. I found out later I had died once from being entombed. And so but I heard my guides in my head say to me, you know what to do. And I realized I did. I slowed down my breathing and I felt myself lift out of my body. And suddenly the bottom of the sarcophagus opened up. It was filled with light and it opened up and I was moving down into the, the pyramid. And I, the, you know, just like in the tunnel, like, why can't I go in the light? I kept thinking, I'm supposed to go up, not down. And I saw, I saw hidden chambers, but what I saw that fascinated me the most, that there was water tunnels under the Great Pyramid. And I'd never heard anyone speak about this. And this was 2014. And from that moment, uh, and, and so I, I saw beyond that, there was what looked the remains of a city. So I know that at one time there was an underground installation under the Great Pyramids. And I went through some type of passageway that led through the Sphinx and right, I shot right out of the head of the Sphinx. And I didn't know that there is actually a hole on the top of the Sphinx's head. And that, in that moment, somebody from my group leaned over the sarcophagus and said, Kathy, are you done in there yet? And immediately I went right back to my physical body. And, you know, I don't know what would have happened had I kept going. And, but I was, I really, after that said, I am going to get down to those water tunnels, no matter what I do. You know, so it took a number of years to to negotiate uh, back and forth with an Egyptology friend, an Egyptologist friend. And, and one day, I, um, I forgot what year it was. Was it 20? I think it was 2018, 2018, went down in or 2017. And we finally agreed on a price. Everything in Egypt is negotiable, you know. <laughs> And but first of all, the Department of Antiquities and the head of the Giza Plateau wanted to know how I knew about the tunnels, because they had not had anyone down in those tunnels for anything of noteworthiness since 1952, when an archaeologist named Dr. Salim Hassan had discovered them. 
and had set up some experiments and so forth down there. And so, you know, there was some rudimentary lighting down there and, and some, st- some ladders going down. It's 150 feet under the, the, uh, the Giza Plateau. So we agreed on a price and like at 4 a.m. in the morning with flashlights, we're moving the three of us, the head of the Giza Plateau, my Egyptologist friend and myself over the, the, over the sands. And we get to under the causeway. And there's a little iron gate there. And he hands me the key. And he says, you want to open? And I said, sure. And from there, you have to go down three levels and down this, these iron ladders that, that you know, don't look all that secure, but <laughs> you, you did it. The first level was just pretty much dry and airless. The second level going down the ladders there, there was seven huge niches in, in the wall where sarcophaguses had been. Only two of them still remained of all those seven niches. And I immediately thought of the seven gods of the underworld. This was something very symbolic. I knew that whatever was down there was part of some ancient um, passing into the afterlife ceremony. When we got down to, and I actually kind of, you know, looked inside the, the two sarcophaguses that were remaining. You can tell, by the way, that those were cast there. There's no way you could bring them down. They were perfectly cast. And, you know, people think that concrete was invented during the Roman times. And no, 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 no. <laughs> the Egyptians had a much better way of using natron and, and, and water and a few other different elements to, to, to put it in place and use slip molds, you know. And I could actually see the resin in the, the seam of it that confirmed it to me. So when I, I went down to the third level, third and final level, there was water lapping around the, the, the rings of the, of the uh, down there. Around. And, and so I had, I could see in the water that there was some papyrus, there was some driftwood from left over from this little tiny pier that they had built back in 1952 so that they could conduct whatever experiments. And under the water was a sarcophagus. And the water probably came up about to hip hip level. And the sarcophagus had writing on it. I, it didn't look like hieroglyphics. It was, I don't know if it was pre-cuneiform, cuneiforms, ancient Sumerian. I don't know what, but it wasn't, it didn't look like hieroglyphics. And I said to the head of the Giza Plateau, has anyone ever opened this sarcophagus? And he said, uh, no. And I thought, oh, I wonder why. And I heard in my head, my guide said, well, they can't because it's hermetically sealed and you have to have the right DNA to open it. It's a portal. So I, I, I had planned on taking water samples and not told on anyone, you know, that I was going to do this. So I tried getting the bottles out of my backpack and my key card from the Mina House Hotel, which was right next door, the hotel, very historical hotel. The card, instead of falling down out of my my backpack, it flew out into the water right on to the sarcophagus. And, and the head of the Giza Plateau, he's, he's trying with a little stick to, to get it, and it's just going further into the silt. So it's still there to this day. I took samples of the water, and the only, and, and I had them analyzed at a lab back in California. And the only thing that was unusual was the level of salinity in the water. Because many years ago, the Nile River came up to the Sphinx Temple, near the Sphinx's feet, not to the actual pyramid. And after the Aswan Dam was built, that, the, the Nile River is like about five miles now from the Giza Plateau. And that's a freshwater river. It's not salt. So, you know, I had to start to track down where the salt, where the salt was coming from. We, de- we determined it wasn't leaching off the walls to that level. And about 75 miles away, we came there, there, there was underground water tunnels at the Huara Pyramid. And that had collapsed over time. And which led me to find out that I started looking at all the different pyramids in the world. Chichen Itza has water tunnels under it. Teotihuacan in, in Mexico has water tunnels under it. The Bosnian Pyramid in, in Croatia has, uh, has water tunnels under it. So I know that water was a prerequisite before they built these structures. And, you know, you know they've gone through used with many, for many uses over time. Uh, but never as a tomb. So 
You know, it's sort of like we've lost so much of our history, unfortunately. So much civilizations have gone down. The earth is like hundreds of millions of years old. And, you know, with continents rising and continents going down and showing that, you know, they've had a, a polar flip eight times on earth. You know, we've lost so much. So much of our history has either been lost or hidden or or purposely, as I said, hidden, you know, because it even even the ancient, even the Egyptians today think everything goes back only 4,000 years ago, because to make it any earlier than that, like Edgar Casey, the sleeping prophet said, you know, the pyramid goes back at least 10,500 years and the Sphinx 10,000, uh, 12,000. But to go back any more than that starts to conflict with religious beliefs. So they, you know, that's why it was so, unfortunately, you know, man now knows so little about his true origins, which is a shame. You mentioned that the pyramids were never used for tombs. And that was going to be my next question is to ask you, what were they actually used for? I've heard a lot of theories out there on the Internet, but what's your perspective? Well, after the third and final upheaval of Atlantis, the the Earth axis, uh, at least this is what I was showed, the, the Earth axis, the pole axis was very unstable. And actually, Egypt was sort of the center, almost the heart center of Earth and ley line wise. Now, the Egyptian, the Atlanteans had their outposts all over the world. They had them in Antarctica and Antarctica back then was was very fertile and lush and so forth. And they had their depositories of knowledge in different places. So, and they were pyramid builders as well. So they, you know, it wasn't like aliens came down and showed the Atlanteans knew a lot of, they were very advanced. They knew a lot of this knowledge and, and passed it on. And they had to stabilize the earth grid. And first of all, that was one of the primary reasons to, for the pyramid. Then it became a power plant. You know, that's why you need water underneath it. And and they generated power. I mean, you could all those theories about slaves. There were no slaves in Egypt. <laughs> you know, they found the, where the workers camps were. They un unearthed them a number of years ago. And mo some of them had surgeries done. Now, you never would have done surgeries on a slave. You just would have, you know. Uh, killed them or something back then. And so many of these were workmen. And uh, and I said to this day, you know, I looked at some of the stones and, and, you know, some of them in some of the pyramids across the world that are very, very similar, have shells in them, have human fingernails, hair. And I'm thinking, you know, that can't very well be sculpted stone because it has organic material in it. So, you know, um, and people have have actually tested the theory about could they have some had some type of concrete they used that was different than the concrete we use today. And actually, everything was formed in place. And the form taken off. And that's kind of what I saw as well. So when I was there, I was seeing things in my mind's eyes like I really related. I knew that I'd spent a lot of time at uh, Seti the First Temple in Abydos, but I remembered the temple underneath it, not the temple that's there right now. And in Saqqara, where all the healing temples were, the Abydos was the temple to the prophets, the home to the order of the Melchizedek, the cosmic priests, the priests to the priests. They could see, they were the timeline readers, the futurists. They could see those things. And all the pharaohs, when they died, they may have had their grave in the Valley of the Kings, but they wanted their symbolic tomb at Abydos because they felt that was really closer to the gods. You know, and there, there is, I won't go into that now, but there is a natural Stargate portal at Abydos. And which is kind of interesting because, you know, then the movie Stargate came out and they took... You know, everything is in the collective consciousness. They took the thing of Abydos and so forth. And, you know, and even I look at it now and I was shown that they had AI during uh, Atlantean times. Uh, they had they'd gone a little too far with their AI. And actually, the god Anubis that we know is the jackal, who is the king, the god of mummification of the Giza Plateau. He's the protector of the graves. He's he's the god to the afterlife. My guide showed me as he was actually AI. He was not. Yes, he was AI. And then they tapped into something I remembered from Edgar Casey saying many years ago in his in his trance state that 
in concerning the hall of records inside the Sphinx, his right paw, that would be found someday, he said, there was a sentry left on duty. You know, there's someone there to protect it so it won't be open before its time. That knowledge needs to be understood again. And I saw immediately they, they left an Anubis. They left a robot. <laughs> and and so when I started to look to see if anybody else had been talking about the fact that Anubis might have been a robot, what did I see? All these video games put Anubis as AI. And I said, see, the collective consciousness already remembers and knows he was AI. That's crazy. Yes. <laughs> a warning for the future about AI. Mm. Yes. Yes. So, yeah, I think there's a lot. We, we, we're, we're repeating. History repeats itself. And because we've lost so much of our history, we, we don't know. We're down, going down the, sometimes the wrong path again. And we're doomed to, to repeat it, which is the sad part. But maybe this time there's a lot more people that are waking up and seeing, you know, what's really happening and their eyes are being opened. And this is a really interesting time to, to be alive. Oh, yeah, for sure. So you have this memory of this past life in Egypt and also in Atlantis. And and like you said, we tend to repeat the same cycles. We know that the Atlantean civilization didn't last. That's another whole topic that we probably don't have time to get into. Uh, Tawina definitely don't have time for it, right? it. Do you have any words of wisdom for us, to, for people listening today? to help us not repeat the same cycles of those civilizations that didn't end up ascending. Don't listen to all the, the chatter out there. Listen to your own inner voice. You know, don't give away your power to somebody else who tells you this is the way it is. This, don't even listen to me. <laughs> you know, follow what resonates inside of you and seek your own inner truth. Because I personally call this the age of discernment, you know, sifting the wheat from the chaff because, you know, what's up seems to be down right now. What's what's true seems to be false or false seems to be true. And, you know, we're in a world where everything seems upside down and we're left to try to figure out, well, who's telling the truth, <laughs> you know, and it's forcing us to go inside to find our own inner truth. And so that's what I would say for people. And that's that's why I wrote the book, Stack's Library of Truth. You know, that that those were all channel books that came down and they're available on Amazon. And that and that those books, I, I they came to me in a dream, the whole plot. And what I saw was that, you know, kind of like the Akashic Records where everything is kept, you know, and on uh, in some some other dimensional realm. Uh, what. They showed me, well, of course, I, I had to go back because I had a client of mine who had a near-death experience. And she said, oh, whoa, I went to a place where I could look up everything on anything. And I said, oh, kind of like a library of truth. And she goes, yeah. And that stuck in my subconscious. So when I had this dream, I saw that inside the Library of Congress, now, I don't know if it really is there. <laughs> you know, I can't say. But inside the Library of Congress, this young employee um, stumbles upon an interdimensional portal into a library of truth where everything is kept on everyone and everything. And, and he finds out that there's this other kind of uh, ancient society that's been manipulating it to manipulate mankind. And so, you know, he tries to, to release a lot of this information. And of course, this is in Washington, D.C., and he sees how all the power brokers of the world, you know, backdoor have, have, have plugged into this. And so, you know, as I'm writing it, things are coming down to me. And, you know, I'm thinking like, oh, that's interesting. I didn't know you could do that, too. So the books became a channel thing. And people would say to me, are you sure this is science fiction? Because it sounds awfully true. So, so yeah. So we, you know, follow your truth. I love that. And on that note, I would, I also want to ask you about the soul trap that you mentioned. Oh, I've okay. Yeah, I've heard several versions of this. And sometimes I've heard people even say that you can't trust your guides because they could be, they're part of the whole setup. And But in your case, it seems like your guides were not part of that and were trying to keep you from going 
and being reincarnated. What's yes. your view on the soul trap? You know, it's I it, I think it's an alien agenda to tell you the truth. <laughs> and um I think that uh well, this is the third dimension is the first dimension where man comes into physical matter. You know, in the other lower dimensions, the second and the first, you know, it's more, you know, the sky, the water, minerals, the mountains and things like that, the elements. And this is the first dimension where we we play an experiment in human form and maybe not just human form either, you know. And I, I think the ancients sometimes got trapped into certain things where they got trapped into half animal, half you as they were experimenting, you know. And so but. In this form, I think that, you know, people learn to deal with their emotional states as well. And I mean, my God, show me there definitely is an alien agenda. You know, there's 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 and and that they feed off that what they call loose energy, which is very discordant energy. And through wars and diversity and hate mongering and everything else, it stirs the pot, which just feeds them. They love it. They love it. And so they would love everything to be to, to have us trapped on this dimension to feed that that energy that they that they seem to crave. I don't know. And but you don't have that in the other dimensions. I mean, you have other sets of problems in the other dimensions as you're learning, but that's not one of them. If you go the fall, the fourth was a fallen dimension. They showed me actually they said Atlantis was in the fourth dimension and it fell. So anything from now, it's the fifth dimension and on. And they said that the fifth dimension, which I saw once in a dream state, you know, they don't have, you know, people aren't stuck in their, their, their iPhones and their iPads and everything else. All that technology we deal with now is all internalized already. Everyone knows what everyone's working on already. You can't lie. You know, the truth is, is like transparent. and. A lot more souls, as they're leaving this dimensional time, this lifetime, are going to be moving to that dimension or beyond wherever they belong, resonate to, and leaving maybe more of the younger souls to work out their whatever they need to work out on the third dimension. I think that there's a lot of old souls here who've gotten kind of complacent, and now they look around and go, you know, things are a little bit too much more crazy here now than I like you know, and I'm, I'm ready to move on after this lifetime. And I've noticed that so many people that I run into lately have opted to not have children in this lifetime as well. And I asked my guys about, they said, that's not leaving any ancestral ties behind when they leave. Now, it's not to say that, you know, you're any less evolved if you decide to stay here, you know, because there's things that maybe you want to experience too. But it does, it is pushing some souls to move on to the next level. And there, there'll be problems with an influx of a lot of souls going into the fifth dimension as well. So, you know, it's like every, and there's 12 dimensions all within each other. They're all encapsulated. So what affects one dimension can ultimately affect another. But here's the crucial thing. Getting back to AI, which I was shown, that if we continue down this path, and try to eliminate human humans by the whole thing of uh, whether it be you know machines to take over to increase make superhuman intelligence and so forth human souls that want to come in and learn on the third dimension can are not compatible with ai because it nullifies their free will and that's what this this is a free will dimension so as less souls opt to come, human angelic souls opt to come down into this dimension, it will eventually, in several hundred years, lead to the collapse of the third dimension. So in essence, any of those aliens that want to keep this dimension for themselves, well, ultimately, it'll do it in anyway. It's, it's sort of like, you know, catch-22. And so, you know, there's a lot of things that are very complicated about going behind the scenes and they've shown me all this. And, you know, sometimes I just, you know, instead of writing books about it, I just put it into my Stacks Library of Truth series or so. So, you know, people can either take it or leave it and, you know, not necessarily take it as truth, but at least maybe they resonate to it. And it's, I think a lot of it is, continues to be a warning. Yeah. 
Okay. One quick follow-up question to that last one I asked you. And that is how do people know if they can trust their the beings that appear to them on the other side? Like how do they know if they can trust their guides? Or is there an if there's a light that's like a reincarnation trap, is there another light that's also the source that can be trusted? Does that make sense? Just go inside and ask yourself. I mean, if you're looking at beings that are appearing to you and telling you something, I would take that maybe with a little bit more caution. But if we all sit and meditate, we all know, you know, there is that still voice. I mean, as a therapist for many years, clients that I had a very difficult client population, most of them were dissociative identity disorder, which used to be multiple personality called that. And they knew, you know, what 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 was real and what wasn't after a while they were high because because they were so abused they were very hyper vigilant to these things and so i would always say you know what is your voice saying inside you know it's and it's it may speak in your own may sound like yourself speaking so you say well i don't really know if that's true because it sounds like me it is you you know you are your own higher self you know forget the guides you know sometimes you have help in certain things and sometimes all these, some of these things have come to me as just an all knowing, you know, and sometimes I'll just ask, you know, you know, check in with sometimes my guides to any verification or add ons to it. But, you know, if my own inner voice has said, this is true, then I go by that. Yeah. You know, even if somebody else is out there that I like what they're, what they're saying, you know, but if I don't resonate with it, you know, I don't take it. Kathy, thank you so much for having this conversation and sharing your story. Would you like to share with the guests where they can find you? They can, you know, a lot of my blogs on Egypt and uh, unusual things can be found on the Trinfinity8.com website under the blog tab. You can also learn about my technology either at Trinfinity8.com or Ascension11.com. Or they can go to, they can find me on Facebook or LinkedIn or StacksLibraryOfTruth.com for my books, website. So any of those, or just, just Google on my name, it'll, you'll find me. <laughs> Wonderful. I'll have those links in the description. Thank you so much, Kathy. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you for watching the Love Covered Life podcast. Don't forget to subscribe, share this video with your friends, and comment with your thoughts and opinions. And check the description box for the links to my TikTok and Instagram where I share the more personal side of my life, my website where I share my paintings and merch, and also the Be A Guest link for anybody who's interested in sharing their story. Be loved, be happy, be at peace, and thank you for watching.